Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our attendees from various parts of the world. My name is Ali Abedi, serving IEEE as Region 1 Northeastern Area Chair and Associate Vice President for Research at the University of Maine. Before we start our webinar today, I would like to thank our IEEE colleagues in Silicon Valley and Boston sections, IEEE Region 1, uh, IEEE USA, IEEE India, and IEEE China for promoting this event, which yielded over 321 registrations. A special thanks to IEEE Communication Society and Computer Society's joint chapter here in Maine, as well as University of Maine Artificial Intelligence Initiative for planning and hosting this event. Uh, please make sure to enter your questions in the Q&A box and we'll answer them at the end of the presentations. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, uh, Dr. Julia Upton, Associate Professor of Mathematics at Austin University, Vice Chair of IEEE Main Section and Chair of IEEE Main Communications and Computer Society Joint Chapter to introduce our speakers. Julia. Thank you, Ali. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone on behalf of uh, IEEE main section and the Joint Computer Society Communication Society chapter. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we, will, we have four speakers for you today. Um, and our first speaker is um, Bill Lair, uh, Rear Admiral, retired Bill Lair served in the United States Navy for 33 years in intelligence and cryptological warfare. His career spanned the Cold War, Desert Storm, and the global war on terrorism. His many Navy assignments included the Deputy Director for Information Technology and Communications at Commander Naval Security Group Command, Fort Meade, Maryland, and at the National Security Agency, where he served as a Senior Operations Officer in the National Security Operations Center. He served as the commanding officer, Naval Information Operations Command in Norfolk, Virginia, where he was selected to flag rank in 2008. As a flag officer, he focused on cyber warfare, serving as the director of information operations on the staff of the chief of naval operations, and as the deputy commander for US Fleet Cyber Command, US 10th Fleet, and the Director of Warfare Integration for Information Dominance on the Navy staff in the Pentagon. He retired from the Navy in 2014 and worked in the defense industry, focusing on developing cyber capabilities for the military. Rear Admiral Lear is a native of Maine and has a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science from the University of Southern Maine and a Master of Arts in National Security and Strategic Studies from the US Naval War College. So let's welcome our first speaker for our artificial intelligence and cybersecurity webinar today. Um, Admiral, your floor. Thank you very much, Dr. Upton. Uh, it's uh, my honor to be, uh, to be part of the panel today. And, and the first thing that I will do, I always get a little nervous when uh, I get in engineering intense uh, environments that I want to emphasize my my science was political science and and today I think you'll see probably a lot more along the policy implications uh, that we have in cybersecurity and and uh, and what that means and I think it tees up some of the other panelists so I've got a pretty short presentation and. Uh, you know, it kind of goes along with, with some thinking that I've been doing of late and, and you know, how are we going to cope with uh, cybersecurity over the next couple of decades? And, you, you know, for all that's been said and, and written about the end of uh, the war on terrorism uh, in Afghanistan, uh, you, you know, we were there for a reason. We were there because the United States was attacked. and. And we spent an awful lot of money in Iraq and Afghanistan over the last two decades. And, and a lot of us will remember exactly where we were uh, 20 years ago uh, in remembrance ceremonies this, this, uh, this Saturday. But, but thinking ahead, you know, coming out of, of where the nation has been, you know, I, I think I come to the conclusion that we're very unlikely to have another large uh, conflict that will commit what we did over the last 20 years 
And if that's only a guess, uh, prognosticators are horribly bad at predicting, predicting war, but uh, what does that mean for, for cyber and cybersecurity in particular? And, you know, we all know if you're looking in this, this kind of area that the, the pace and the complexity of, of global cyber attacks in the last, you know, 25 years has uh, changed significantly. Now, from my bio, you, you'll get pretty quickly that I was the part of the Navy in the part of the Navy that uh, was associated with National Security Agency in Fort Meade. I spent, you know, most of the last uh, 15 years of my career in that environment. And, you know, through that, I saw, you know, that, that really, you know, how we use cyber uh, as part of espionage and, and, you know, as time went on and, and being involved in the standup of, you know, the Navy Cyber Service, uh, Fleet Cyber Command and 10th Fleet, you know, there's really that, that spectrum, that espionage where it probably started in all nations. There's certainly cyber crime that affects us all. And, and then, you know, what I focus on and what I think about is, is what cyber means for warfare. And you know, for warfare, it's seen the same kind of uh, evolution that that we've seen in, in protecting businesses and protecting everything from from kitty scripts to phishing to zero uh, day exploits, and and lastly with the solar winds uh, attack, uh, you know, a, a very complex supply chain uh, exploit, and and the costs are are mind boggling, really. If you go back to you know, what was clearly a politically motivated, uh, you know, attack in 2007 in Estonia, you know, it's really hard to pinpoint what the costs were. And, you know, some loss to banking revenue is estimated around a million dollars. And you go forward, you know, you know, eight years uh, to what happened in, in Saudi Arabia, again, probably a politically motivated attack and retribution for uh, for Stuxnet, you know, 35,000 computers, another 7,500 servers destroyed, and and it, and it put the Saudi Arabia oil economy at risk. Uh, a couple of years later, with NotPetya, again, you know, computers destroyed, more servers destroyed, billions lost. And one of the interesting things about NotPetya is that a United States insurance. Uh, uh, carrier declared that it was an act of war and, and has refused to, to pay on insurance. So these kind of uh, challenges are in the national security realm for all that we do with solar, solar uh, cybersecurity. And lastly, within within the year, you know, solar winds, which is an incredibly complex supply chain attack. And what I think has caused me, you know, thought and worry as, as it go is the, you know, almost the sense of helplessness and, and where do you start to unravel this that I heard from cybersecurity experts and people who are trying to put together the solar winds attack. And, you know, a study that was done by, you know, presidential panel uh, 2016, that, you know, these costs, you know, mount between, you know, seven, 57 and 109 billion. Uh, it's an incredible amount of money that's lost to the economy. And so if we do have this situation where we are, you know, looking for, you know, what cybersecurity looks like in a con uh, outside of a conflict, you know, we, we've got to think about where we are with deterrence and you know, we know that there's a close relationship between criminal hackers and nation state at, uh, attackers that, you know, an example of that is in, in many pieces of uh, malware, you can see that it checks for the presence of a Cyrillic keyboard. Uh, so it, it, it doesn't land on a Russian target. Uh, the United States has tried, you know, criminal indictments, but they're incredibly difficult to act on. Uh, there are often conflicting roles between espionage and cybersecurity. Uh, we saw that in, in the Obama administration with, you know, agreements with President Z that we kind of left that all off the table because we, we do want to collect intelligence. But it, with, with all deterrence, there's a necessity to back up uh, what we're trying to uh, prevent with some actions. And I think we've seen a different look with, with President Biden and, 
in the warning to Russia uh, with PPD-21 uh, warning. But the, the problem with PPD-21, it's incredibly broad. It's everything. And if everything is important, how are we going to really make that enforceable? And, you know, followed by that, did it have an effect? Is the our evil uh, kind of disappearing from the... Uh, uh, from the you know environment for a while is that connected? Yeah, I don't. I think it's too early to know. But but also in a more promising thing, you know, shortly after the uh, Putin Biden uh, summit, there was a Microsoft uh, Exchange server attack that was uh, attributed to China, and and both NATO and the EU joined the United States in in condemning that. So there's got to be these kind of, of things uh, happening in this environment where we're uh, using all the tools of national security to be able to do that. And, and lastly, you know, I think it's, you know, we're going to have to rethink cybersecurity over the long haul and, and what, you know, it could mean over the next couple of decades. And, and you know, security has to be more by default. It, it, you turn it on, it's going to be secure. That's two-factor authentication, digital identities, for most things that we do online. I know that's controversial. There are some machine learning AI things with fileless malware detection. You know, a company called Blue Vector, you know, has advanced threat detection that it, it learns pretty quickly what uh, a normal environment looks like and is very quick to, uh, to identify those things that are abnormal and, and likely malware in an environment. And, and work with uh, traditional cybersecurity systems. Zero trust, it's a huge thing within the federal government and DOD. Uh, I think that has to be how we think about uh, systems going forward. Um, I have to make it more difficult to remove information from a system. And in, in that area, it's things, you know, data loss prevention, it looks again, with machine learning tools to, to do behavioral analysis in real time to say this, this is something that you don't have permission to do. Uh, and one of the things we learned from uh, solar winds is you know, policy enforcement, which we've generally talked about in terms of how uh, it, it applies to individuals, but policy enforcement also has to apply to uh, software authorities. And if you thought a little bit about the SolarWind product that was being used to uh, distribute patches, uh, what, uh, what can your software access and, and, and what should it not be able to access? So, so uh, bringing uh, that thinking that we've done uh, in a human sense to a machine sense as well. And, and the last thought is, you know, comes from an article that was, you know, published in Foreign Affairs about a year ago by General Nakasone, who's the commander for United States Cyber Command, and, and is defending Ford. Now, in a traditional military sense, defending Ford is something that we've always thought about. You, if you wait for someone to attack you, you're, you're probably going to lose 100% of the time. I've long argued that that cyber is no different than defending an air base or or defending against a submarine. And, and General Nakasone basically says we have to defend beyond the perimeter of the nation. And that leads to, you know, I think really how we think about cyber defense, how we leverage the, the practices and the authorities of our allies to be able to do that. So I think that's about uh, my time and I will uh, turn it back over to Julia. Thank you very much, Admiral. Um, if you have any questions for the Admiral, please type them into the Q&A uh, portion and we'll address them at the end. Our second speaker is uh, Scott McGann. Scott McGann has been a special agent with the Federal Bureau of Investigations for 25 years. During his time with the FBI, he has investigated white collar crime, the Russian and Italian mafias, cybercrime, counterterrorism, and espionage matters. Special Agent McGon is an FBI certified firearms instructor, a member of the FBI's evidence response team, a certified police instructor, an FBI uh, adjunct faculty member teaching FBI coursework to police agencies domestically and abroad. He received his undergraduate degree from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, his Master of Science in Criminal Justice from the University of Massachusetts at Lowell, 
and his MBA from Bentley University. He currently teaches issues in cybercrime and cybersecurity as an adjunct faculty member at Yale Massachusetts Law. In addition, Special Agent McGon was nominated for the 2018 Attorney General's Award for Fraud Prevention and the 2018 FBI Director's Award for Outstanding Criminal Investigation for his involvement in an international corporate espionage investigation. Agent McGon is the alpha team leader for Operation Warp Speed, the government's full-scale effort to secure the development and delivery of the COVID-19 vaccine. He currently is also involved in training and speaking to the private sector. In academia about cyber threats, corporate espionage, counterintelligence matters, insider threats, and intellectual property theft on, the, on behalf of the FBI. Well, welcome special agent, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Upton. Uh, I'm gonna talk about something that's a, a little bit outside the normal realm for engineers. And, and I, I genuinely thank my colleague for just introducing some of the ideas of espionage and hacking and all of those things that I talk a great deal about. But one of the things that I've been involved with lately that the American public generally doesn't get to see is a number of different aspects to the whole subject of foreign influence. And what I'm referring to is that our country has a number of different adversaries out there in the world, and uh, as, as does every country, certainly. Uh, but as part of this, uh, there are adversaries out there, nation states that are looking to obtain our technology when they can't develop it themselves. So as uh, IEEE, a society of engineers uh, who are out there working hard to develop these things, we don't want to see that idea, uh, that intellectual property stolen by foreign agents. And so I want to talk a little bit about that because the how it used to happen in the past is not how it happens now when we're discussing espionage. In the past, we used to talk about uh, spies coming into the country, developing sources and assets, and, and they would steal. But now it's so much broader than that. And I want to give you a little bit of an idea of how that has developed. We've seen the headlines uh, previously all over the nation about uh, different entities, uh, different countries obtaining intellectual property, whether at universities or research associations or at companies, uh, obtaining this technology for their own benefits. Certainly something that the FBI in their counterintelligence, counterespionage divisions try to work against. I, I, I'm just amazed that I can even show you this slide that it's been unclassified in years past we certainly wouldn't talk about anything related to counterintelligence. But as you can see here from uh, this slide, we have a number of counterintelligence cases throughout the government, uh, throughout the FBI. And the cases on technology transfer have increased markedly over the last two decades. Uh, I became involved with uh, intellectual property theft and economic espionage in the middle of my career and have not gotten away from it because it's become so prevalent. You can see that cases on economic espionage and counterproliferation of technology has uh, increased to about a third of our total counterintelligence cases. And again, from my perspective, being a, an FBI agent for 26 years, I have never seen the FBI put out a slide like this previously to the public. Um, so this should be all new information for you, but it highlights the importance of technology transfer. And I use that term in the pejorative uh, of technology transfer at the FBI. Uh, and, and what I alluded to previously was that technology transfer is coming in a lot of nefarious, uh, from a lot of nefarious vectors. It used to be just spies coming here trying to find information uh, and bring it back to their home country. And certainly we have that, we, uh, that has never gone away. But we also have different uh, entities, different nation states uh, influencing our government as we've heard about in the 2016 election, certainly in the 2020 elections this topic has come to the fore, but also more importantly, and I 
I'm in the Boston area and work in greater New England. And I can tell you, I have seen non-traditional collectors at the 12 o'clock position on this graphic. Non-traditional collectors have become uh, much more important to foreign governments. And so these non-traditional collectors are people who are not trained spies, but they simply have access to the information that other governments want. And for various reasons, and sometimes because of a little intimidation, they provide this information uh, from our country to their, typically their country of origin or to other foreign governments. There are a number of different ways that foreign governments will obtain in, uh, intellectual property information and the ideas that engineers develop either through hacking, influence, or a lot of times through talent conversion where they will have talent recruitment programs and a number of uh, countries have this where they will acquire information from an individual who is a leader in that particular field. So if the field is nanotechnology, they will effectively co-op someone through money, cash, or a number of other methodologies uh, in order to provide that country with information uh, on nanotechnology in that particular example. So some of the techniques are legal, certainly joint ventures or providing money and investment into companies is legal, but oftentimes those techniques are not uh, clearly transparent in what's going on and certainly unethical at a minimum. I'll give you an example in the talent plan uh, case that I just mentioned regarding technology. Uh, some of you may know he made headlines last year, Dr. Lieber of Harvard University uh, was arrested by myself and some of my colleagues uh, for making false statements uh, was the initial charge. But he was allegedly involved in a talent program. And I'll show you here an excerpt from the affidavit for the arrest warrant, where it's highlighted here that he was getting $50,000 per month and an extra $150,000 a year for living expenses and money to develop a lab over at the Wuhan Institute of Technology. Uh, you can see here an extra $50,000 a month on top of a uh, what I perceive to be a generous Harvard stipend, uh, an annual salary, uh, was certainly motivating for Dr. Lieber when I arrested him with my colleagues. Um, he was certainly not surprised to see uh, that this was something. So if you are approached as an engineer out there developing some new technology, um, uh, or someone at your uh, company has been approached, uh, there is a quid pro quo expected when someone's paying you $50,000 a month uh, for the information that's in your head. Uh, here is a, a traditional spy, Ms. Ye here, was at Boston University uh, posing as a uh, student. She was a member of a top military academy and directed by a foreign government. Uh, last year, we looked to arrest her, but she already skipped town and uh, before she could be arrested. This young man was a medical student as well in the Boston area, and his uh, activities were discovered at the airport when 21 vials of a biological substance were found wrapped in his sock when he was trying to go back to his country of origin. He was arrested at Logan Airport. What's more interesting about this particular case is that this happened 30 times within a six month period with different individuals. Um, so this is uh, the wholesale theft of intellectual property, in this case from our bio, bio uh, pharma industry in the Boston area. And as far as corporate espionage goes, here's a great case. I like this case. I call it a great case because it was one of my cases. Uh, American Superconductor was a company here in Massachusetts and their intellectual property, their low voltage ride through solution for your electrical engineers out there in the audience uh, was stolen by a foreign company. Um, and they used the traditional uh, money uh, ego assuasion and uh, sexual favors uh, in order to uh, get Dejan Karabasevic seen right here, who is a Serbian national, uh, to flip for their particular company. So he 
was the insider at American Superconductor who gave the crown jewels to a foreign competitor. Uh, a very interesting case, which I can usually talk about at length. Um, it was just made into an FBI documentary, which will be coming out this month. So very good case on economic espionage. And intelligence operations will target academics and researchers and recruit uh, people at various companies in our country and will often make contact through professional networking sites. I am not immune from this. Uh, here, Mandy, which I'm sure is her given name, uh, reached out to me on LinkedIn. As I get to the end of my career, I put up a LinkedIn page and it wasn't very long before Mandy wanted to be friends. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the US government isn't really enamored with TikTok. But I'm sure it's okay because you note down here that the culture there is magical. So I'm sure it's okay to accept that uh, LinkedIn connection. I just uh, screenshotted this as, uh, for my future lectures because it was something I had talked about in the past. And here it was uh, it actually happened to me. But not only that, but more interestingly, is my, uh, my two sons who are young males in their early 20s were approached by Asian individuals, attractive females on their social media right after I ignored this, uh, uh, this connection request. And certainly um, they don't mind clicking on connections with attractive uh, females from other countries, but they came to me having had the counterintelligence lecture that I give my children uh, being sons of an FBI agent and I said, yeah, that's because of me, thanks. And uh, they ignored those connections. So this does happen. And it's something you're probably not very familiar with or haven't heard much of, but it does happen all over our country every day, happens to people in the IEEE as well. Um, and quickly, what can we do to protect ourselves? I tell everybody, call your local FBI and partner with them. Uh, corporations who are out there can get better lectures uh, than this brief introduction and can get information on risks and conflicts of interest. We speak to boards, we speak to uh, executives, we talk to administrators at research institutions all over the country. So get with your local FBI and ask for their private sector coordinator. There's one in every FBI office and they will be able to assist you in protecting yourselves. And certainly they can hook you up with the cyber uh, crime squad. I worked in computer hacking for a dozen years. I was on the cyber crime squad. And even though I left it to work other matters, I never got away from cyber crime. So I still go out there and lecture on business email compromise and ransomware and hacking and uh, dark web and all of these other subjects but I wanted to introduce you to the subject of uh, foreign influence and espionage, um, something you probably don't get a lot of at your regular uh, meetings. And uh, I thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, if you have any questions, please post them in Q&A. And it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Dan Shoemaker. Dr. Dan Shoemaker received a doctorate from the University of Michigan in 1978. He taught at Michigan State University and then moved to the directorship of the information systems function for the medical schools at MSU. He held a joint teaching and department chair positions at Mercy College of Detroit. When Mercy was consolidated with the University of Detroit in 1990, he moved to the business school to chair their department of computer information systems he attended the organizational rollout of the discipline of software engineering at the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute uh, in the fall of 1987. And he was already teaching an SEI-based software engineering curriculum, which he established as a separate degree program to the MBA within the UDM College of Business Administration. Dr. Shoemaker's specific areas of scholarship, publication, and teaching were the process-based stages of the waterfall, specifications, SQA, and acceptance sustainment. He was also a primary consultant in the Detroit area on the CMM, CMMI. 
Dr. Shoemaker's transition into cybersecurity came as a result of the audit and compliance elements of that body of knowledge, as well as the long established SQA SCM elements of their curriculum. They were designated the 39th Center of Academic Excellence by the NSA at West Point in 2004. And they have tried to stay on the leading edge in the architectural aspects of cybersecurity systems design and implementation, as well as software assurance. As a result of Dr. Shoemaker's associations with NSA and his interest in software assurance, he participated in the earliest meetings of the Software Assurance Initiative. He was one of the three authors of the common body of knowledge to produce, acquire, and sustain software. And he chaired the Workforce Education and Training Committee from 2007 to 2010. He was chair of Workforce Training and Education for the Software Assurance Initiative at DHS. And he was subject matter expert for, uh, you know, for NICE, security provision. Dr. Shoemaker was also a subject matter expert for the um, Human Security 2017. He also published frequently in the Build Security and website. This exposure led to a grant to develop curricula for software assurance and the founding of the Center for Cybersecurity where he currently resides. The center is a freestanding academic unit in the College of Liberal Arts, which is the administrative locus for research centers within um, UDM. Dr. Shoemaker's final significant grant was from the Department of Defense to develop a curriculum and teaching and course materials for secure acquisition in conjunction with the Institute for Defense Analysis and the National Defense University. A book was subsequently published by CRC Press. Welcome, Dr. Shoemaker. Okay, where am I? Uh, I can hear me. I can't see me. We can uh, see you. We can hear you. We can see you and hear you. Okay, well, then I'm here. I am. Um, greetings, everybody. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, when I do these things, I try to think about something that a uh, group would find interesting. So uh, what I came up with uh, is pretty well covered by the first two uh, people. And so I guess I'll just say next speaker. Um, I Let me get my slides up. Um, when I do these uh, IEEE visits, I try to come up with something that is sort of fits with the, the group I'm talking to. Um, most of the time I end up talking about supply chain risk management, which is my alleged area of expertise. Um, and um, I, thanks to the solar winds people, I, I find myself talking to a lot of, a lot of folks about that, but um, since this was AI, I kind of, uh, you know, sort of try to come up with something that would be at least fit within that kind of context. And uh, what I came up with was uh, some work I did back in the 2008. Uh, was it was published basically in a book, um, uh, uh, kind of on the topic of cybercrime. Um, and then what do I end up doing is following an FBI agent. So, you know, you can take for what I've got to say, uh, you know, for whatever it's worth. Um, but it's a modest proposal and it fits within kind of an IA context. So um, what you've seen so far in the first two presenters uh, is true. Um, we've got a worldwide problem with cybercrime or cyber attacks. Take your pick. Um, Microsoft did a survey that was really eye-opening, published back in December, uh, about the, the kind of the, the cost of, of cyber attacks, uh, global cost. Um, that's not just in the US. Um, $500 billion with a B in 2015. Um, and kind of we worked on the problem and by uh, 2020, it had escalated to $2 trillion um uh, globally <clears throat> and um by the time 2024 rolls around the estimate is six trillion 
So uh, it looks like uh, cyber crime is a growth industry, it's something that, you know, I don't recommend you buy stock in, but um, and I guess it's because it's so easy. Um, one of the things you might want to use as a sense of context is uh, that six trillion is the gross national product of England, Germany, and France. Uh, and, you know, and so you know that's kind of a pretty big hit into uh, in the global economy. Um, now the reason why, obviously, and people on the first two presenters talked about this at great length, uh, is the nature of the internet. Um, it's anonymous and it's borderless, and so. How in the world do you uh, defend against or prosecute uh, some guy who is sitting somewhere, you know not where, um, attacking you, uh, maybe from the other side of the world? Um, and um, it's possible in certain countries that if they're successful in doing that to you, um, they may end up with a, uh, you know, a medal uh, to, as a reward. Um, and, you know, basically what you've got is a, is a bunch of uh, cultures um, that um, are, are not necessarily um, going to be big fans of the United States. Uh, and here we are sitting there kind of like a big fat uh, uh, plum waiting to be picked off a tree. And so the Internet itself makes it almost impossible to... to um, uh, find and catch the bad guys. Um, obviously, some of them are willing to get lead footprints, but uh, the idea basically is that um, the internet criminal is what's known as an unknown, unknown subject. Um, and the only way to really kind of address an unknown subject is by uh, the classical uh, approach known as profiling. Um, which basically uses big behavioral signature, signatures. Uh, now, profiling has been around for a really long time. Uh, first profile was done in for Jack the Ripper. I don't know, 18-something or other. Uh, and it's developed as a, a aspect of criminology for years, for, I mean, since then. Um, and there are, um, you know, techniques uh, that are, well recognized, well known, and used in 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 uh, criminal justice. Uh, talking about them from a uh, uh, a cyber standpoint uh, is kind of a novel thing, because the key basically is the behavioral signatures. Um, it's all based on collecting uh, what amounts to evidence of um, you know kind of the nature of the crime. Uh, all crimes have motive, means, and opportunity. And so you can kind of classify what you see and what you read uh, in the, those actions as, um, you know, a means of kind of uh, characterizing the individual that, that's basically committed the crime. Um, now, since it's done on a digital device, that actually makes it sort of easier uh, because uh, it's possible to build an inductive profile uh, using the evidence that you gather uh, from the actual actions that are taken on the, um, you know, by the individual uh, and recorded, uh, or at least available to be, um, you know, kind of accessed through system logs and things like that. Um, and essentially what you've got is a pattern of behavior that may or may not be used to kind of create a typology. And that typology is something that you can then use as a basis for either investigating or um, preventing uh, a type of a, uh, you know, a, a, a certain types of, of attack, criminal attacks. <clears throat> um, things like system logs and system level reconstructions of attack behavior, uh, you know, are, are, first of all, they exist, um, you know, in the sense that, that it's something that's part of system processing. Um, and at the same time, uh, you know, there are timelines and things like that that you can use as a basis for um, um, kind of, not kind of, for, for following the tax uh, and characterizing. Um, uh, the timestamp time pattern analysis, again, is a fairly common um, uh, method for uh, incident response. Um, and 
um, we were using uh, uh, from a standpoint of looking at um, kind of coding attacks, uh, things like stylistic and linguistic characteristics. All of that's something that the machine keeps just simply as part of its processing. Um, but at the same time, you have a um, opportunity to, to use that as evidence or as a basis at least for building profiles uh, of, of criminal activity, or if you want to use the simple term attacks uh, on, uh, and, and those attacks basically can, can be uh, formed into a uh, type of, of uh, proactive response. Uh, now, the idea here basically is that, and those of you who are sitting here listening to this are saying, well, that, that sounds like a network uh, intrusion detection, automated intrusion detection systems, which is true. <clears throat> but at the same time, you can extend that into, um, you know, the realm of actual, um, you know, any kind of aggressive action taken against a uh, target um, a targeted resource. Um, and that basically is something that is um, then that you can essentially build a defense against or respond to as appropriate. Um, now, since this is an AI uh, session, uh, the thing that I wanted to raise is the fact that this can be managed by artificial intelligence. Now, what you end up with is, uh, you know, three general types of, of, of uh, AI type um, you know, profile management systems. Uh, one is simply to have a baseline of profiles, uh, which then end up as a pretty much like a virus checker, you know, to identify uh, a criminal behavior uh, at the point of attack um, and then do something appropriate in terms of either shutting off the system or shutting off the access, or even just sending a signal that says we're being attacked. Um, you can also use baseline anomalies, which is basically the same thing. You've got a profile, but in this particular case, you get something that just simply doesn't fit inside the profile uh, with the assumption that uh, if it's anomalous, it's probably enemy action. Uh, and that can actually uh, identify things that are not necessarily a, uh, what do you call it, captured in the behavior patterns uh, that you've used to build the po profile. Um, the problem with that one is it can generate false positives, a lot of false positives. And so it's not something that's really very practical right now. And last but not least, you can have anomalous processing, which is, uh, will identify the attack as it's happening because essentially what's going on in terms of the normal sequence of events in the side of the computer is not, it's not kosher. It's not something that uh, would, would be normal. And if that's the case, um, you know, you can get a warning at the point where the attack's occurring. Um, the problem with that, again, is it's complex and hard to manage. And all this basically is nothing more than me talking about um, kind of some novel approach that you might take based on what amounts to <clears throat> well-established uh, processes, uh, both uh, from a criminal justice standpoint and also from the standpoint of computing. And um, that, from my, you know, is basically all I have to talk about here. Uh, any questions, any discussions you want, I guess I'll handle that at the end. Thank you very much, Dan. And the uh, last speaker today is Dick Wilkins, Principal Technology Liaison for Phoenix Technologies Limited, a U.S.-based independent platform firmware development company and also an associate professor of computer science and cybersecurity at Thomas College in Central Maine, recently retired. He sits on the board of the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface Forum and leads their security response team. He is a leader in the IEEE at the section level and in the Computer Society and is active in the ACM and PMI. He has over 30 years industry experience in roles from software engineer to director of engineering at companies like Hewlett Packard, Digital Equipment Corporation, Microsoft, Amazon, and several smaller firms. 
Professor Wilkins holds a PhD in computer science from Nova, Nova Southeastern University, a master of science in computer science from the National Technological University, and a bachelor of arts in public administration from St. Thomas University in Miami, Florida. Um, welcome, Dick. Thank you very much, Dr. Upton. I appreciate the uh, introduction. Um, let me go ahead and get my slides up here. Okay. So I'm gonna take this from the general to a little more specific. I'm gonna talk about AI in relation to security around uh, platform firmware. Now, most of you may say, well, gee, isn't that platform firmware stuff uh, something that runs in the first couple of milliseconds or you know, first few seconds at most of a computer system as it boots up and then kind of goes away? And why do I care? And what does this interest me? Uh, what, why do I care about the security of that particularly? Um, in fact, um, it's a serious problem in, uh, that I'm going to be demonstrating to you, but in our first presentation today, um, a couple of those early and most impactful attacks, and particularly um, notorious is the Saudi Arabian uh, Aramco attack, was a firmware attack where they exfiltrated a bunch of uh, data from those systems and then bricked them and turn over 35,000 computers into boat anchors. And the company had to completely replace their entire IT infrastructure. So this is an example of how serious firmware attacks can be. So, uh, yeah, there we go. So firmware is critical. It's the, it runs right after power up. Initials, initializes the CPU and hardware protections, updates the CPU microcode. It controls the highly secure interprocessor modes that even the operating system and hypervisors can't touch. It protects non-volatile memory, system updates, etc. It securely boots the OS and maintains a root of trust from the CPU hardware itself at power up through all of the initialization and bootloaders and everything else out to an operating system and theoretically all the way out to an application so that a system can be proven to be secure at, at least until the app runs. Now, once it's online and connecting to the internet, of course, all bets are off and it can be attacked. But Vendors, software vendors and operating system vendors have been working really hard over the last many years to, well, ever since the um, internet system started getting connected to the internet to protect their stuff. Um, and so it turns out that um, what's left is firmware. Um, continuing with my list here, it can attest to the system security, the firmware can, and provide evidence to an external verifier um, that the system is okay. Um, and it provides critical services to OSs and applications while they're running. And people don't realize that's going on, but the firmware is still there and still operational. And lastly, it's persistent. If you can modify, change, or hack a system firmware, then it's there potentially forever. And even wiping the system and starting with a new disk drive or something like that can't remove it. So as paraphrasing a Google engineer from a few, a few years ago, if you don't own your firmware, your firmware owns you. So what is platform firmware? It's, you know, it's the thing that I've been talking about here, but depending on the implementation and what it's for and what kind of platform it is, it can be thousands of lines to millions of lines of code. Most commonly nowadays, it follows the open UEFI standard. Um, and the, as the footnote here on the slides is the unified extensible firmware interface specification that defines the uh, interfaces between the operating system and applications and the underlying firmware during the boot process and then after the system is up and running. Um, there is 
a custom, most implementations of this are customized from an uh, open source Tiano Core implementation. That's code name from when it was first submitted to the open source. There are also older um, boot firmware called U-Boot and Coreboot are the most common. They're also open source. And they're typically used for embedded and IoT devices and a, a lot for phones and things like that. They form the basis for some of the Chromebooks and things like that out there. But um, nowadays they're now standardizing on the UEFI interfaces. So even while it's a completely different implementation, they're doing UEFI things. Lastly, there is Linux boot, basically a minimal Linux uh, piece of software that's used to boot full Linux. Uh, this is more of an experimental thing that's going on and a lot of people are playing around with it, but it's really um, uncommon in uh, commercial systems. Modern implementations of this, of all of these, use hashing and signatures to make sure they're running secure and unmodified code. They also use secure updates and NA rollback to make sure that nobody is providing them bad code over the internet and causing them to update or roll back to older unsecure code, et cetera. Uh, they also tend to measure themselves, also referred to as measured boot, so that they can attest to their security and the fact they've been unmodified to an external verifier um, that may control their access to networks and things like that. As these things that I've been talking about here are best practices. They're the things that should be done to make sure firmware is secure, but many low cost and IoT devices, embedded systems, and Surprisingly and annoyingly, a lot of PCs and servers out there don't follow this or they turn it off. Or, um, and so they're not as secure as they should be. But this is not your 1970s BIOS, the thing we talk about, you usually see. The industry continues to use the term BIOS as a shorthand for platform firmware, but it really isn't anything like what IBM created for their first PC back in the 1970s and early 80s. So I put up this not for any specific piece of information, but I want to point out just generally, the million line plus BIOS is just the, the first line in this uh, chart of the firmware that gets loaded on a machine. Uh, but there's all kinds of other code that runs during the boot process that secures the system, updates the microcode. This is for a currently uh, widely available Intel processor, an example of the bill of materials of the firmware that um, gets loaded at boot time and initialized and run during the startup of an Intel uh, CPU. So the details don't matter here. I'm just pointing out there's a lot of stuff here and it's really important. And if it gets damaged in some way by a hacker, bad things can happen. Oops, we somehow got ahead of ourselves here. Let's see, okay. Ah, so this is an AI presentation. So I want to make sure that we tie this back to how does AI fit into this issue of security of platform firmware. So if I'm an IT manager, I want to know that all the devices in my system are following the best practices and are properly protected and are doing the right thing with their firmware. Because again, if any of them is compromised, they can all be compromised. And bad things can happen throughout the network. Um, I've seen baseboard management controllers in multi-million dollar servers with hundreds or uh, hundreds of processors anyway, uh, where the baseboard management controller, an old piece of firmware and software that manages the system operation where that thing has been penetrated and it has spread an infection to every virtual machine running across hundreds of processors within the same box 
and then it can then expand out to the entire network. So I want to be able to scan all the devices in my network in real time and identify vulnerable damage devices, anything bad that could be going on. And I want to identify devices at risk, even if they're not currently behaving badly. Intrusion detection systems are fine monitoring the network using AI to look for patterns and bad behaviors and identify devices that have been damaged. But gee, wouldn't it be nice to be able to um, identify them before they go rogue, before they start exfiltrating data from my, from my network, et cetera? So, but there are thousands of devices. They're running firmware from many sources and of many types. I've, I've talked in the previous slide about, gee, how much there is out there. Uh, how can I make sure that they're not vulnerable, they're not damaged by an attacker, that they're not in, in some way going to come and bite me in the rear end? So one option is to use AI machine learnings to scan them and evaluate their, their assets. So here's a um, kind of a marketing picture, really, of what a system might look like that does that. Uh, we have a user interface. Um, it's step one there that you can schedule an immediate scan of your, of your network or um, have a, a, a scan that runs periodically or whatever. Then we have scanning software, the red ball in the middle, that goes out and touches everything on my network and takes a look at the firmware that's running there, its attributes, its configuration, etc. And then, uh, then sends that data out to a secure cloud, which runs AI algorithms to uh, identify what's going on here. Then very quickly, because we're running out of time, uh, we want to extract an image of what's going on. We want to scout it for improper configuration, invalid code signatures, et cetera, known vulnerabilities. This can be done without machine uh, learning, but then we can use uh, machine learning, simulate the, the code flow to make sure a uh, chain of trust is maintained, regenerate C code from the binary image, do static code analysis, et cetera. We can identify invulnerabilities, observe risky code practices, et cetera. We can identify issues and we can take automatic action or we can tell an IT manager that this device is suspect and you want to evaluate it and uh, do manual analysis. And lastly, before I wrap up here, I just want to say, we can apply this to other potential kinds of networks. How about 5G networks with phones and tablets and IoT? How about smart vehicle systems, autos, trucks, et cetera? And what about that autonomous vehicle? Wouldn't you like to have somebody checking that the driverless delivery truck firmware that's traveling in the lane next to you on the highway is actually secure and safe? Uh, and there are potentially many other uh, things where we could apply this to. So uh, anyway. That's it for me, thank you. Uh, so unfortunately we're out of time. Um, excellent presentations, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to moderate this panel and the panelists have been typing their answers for some of the questions from the audience into the Q&A, thank you very much. And for closing remarks, here's Dr. Abdi. Thanks very much uh, okay. again, uh, Julia, our moderator and also our speakers. And also those of you who attended this live presentation or watching the recording later, if you put your question in Q&A and the speakers were not able to answer them live, we'll post the answers later on on our AI website. I just wanna bring to your attention that if you like this presentation, we have our October 7 event coming up, AI in a space and aerospace event. And also uh, we have our November 4 event, AI in healthcare. And we have NASA and NIH speakers coming in. So thanks very much again, everyone, for joining us today. And uh, you can watch the recording of this later uh, on our website. If you would like a PDH or CEU certificate, you can just email your name and email address and your affiliation to the email I shared in the chat box, uh, umain.ai at main.edu, and you receive your certificate. So thanks again, and see you next time.